All right, guys. We are live, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us for the very first American Dahlia Society live stream. My name is Jessica Becker, and I'm the chair of the Cut Flower Committee for the ADFs. Tonight, we're going to talk about hybridizing dahlias and how you can get started creating your own cultivars. Before we begin, I'm sure there's some new dahlia growers in the audience, and I just want to quickly touch base, uh, touch on some dahlia basics. So if you're looking for an exact copy of an existing dahlia, you're dealing with tubers or cuttings of dahlias. If you're looking to create a brand new dahlia, you're going to be starting from seed or hybridizing dahlias, which is what we're going to discuss today. So I'd like to welcome our panel, Leanne Huber from Cozy Town Flowers, Rich Gibson from 20th Ave Dahlias, Wayne Lobal from Lobal's Dahlias, and Christine Albright from Santa Cruz Dahlias. So for our first question of the night, I'm gonna start with you, Leanne. I'd like you to share where you live and how long you've been growing Dahlias. And then Rich, Wayne, and Christine, I'll ask you to answer the same. Sure, I'd love to. So I'm Leanne and I have Cozy Town Flowers and you can find me in the northeast part of the country. I live in south central Pennsylvania and I've been growing dahlias for a little over a decade now. Okay, and Rich? Hey, good evening, everyone. So yeah, I live right outside of Washington, D.C. in Hyattsville, Maryland, and I've been growing dahlias for 20 years. Okay, Wayne? I live in Chehalis, Washington, and that is halfway between Portland and Seattle, and we've been growing dahlias for about 30 years. I'm Christine. Hi, I'm Christine. Thank you for having us all here today. This is really fun to talk about hybridizing. I've been growing dahlias for about 18 years here in Santa Cruz, California. We're on, we're about, our farm's about a quarter mile from the Pacific Ocean, and we're about an hour or so south of San Francisco. Um, and that's pretty much it. All right. And in the same order, I was hoping that you guys would be able to share how you got interested in hybridizing dahlias. So Leanne, would you like to go? Oh, sure thing. So I started growing flowers, cut flowers to sell at local markets. And over the years, I kept buying in more and more dahlias. And 100% of all the flowers and now dahlias that I grow are field grown. Um, so I kept rotating through a series of varieties, really not finding the type of plant and bloom I was looking for to withstand the environment that field grown flowers have to be um, grown in and then also being suitable for cutting. So they have to handle being handled um, repeatedly, uh, taking the stress of the day, and then of course, getting to the customer in the good condition. So I felt like there is a gap in the market and I picked my favorite varieties and started collecting seed and starting from there. Me, Rich? Sure. So, you know, I, I had joined the local Dahlia Society, you know, and initially what I had heard was, you know, oh no, seedlings are no good. You got to grow already established cultivars. And, you know, I was like, oh, okay. But then one of my friends, John Spangenberg, who, who does the crazy four dahlias, you know, he was like, oh yeah, I take seed and it's really cool because every day you get to see something new. So I didn't, you know, I didn't have any big goals, but I was just like, oh, I want to give something a try and see what happens, you know? And I think I just started, you know, 2010 is when I first started taking seed. And it was just kind of like, let's see what I get, you know, and got hooked pretty quick. Great. Wayne? Um, I have been growing dahlias about 10 years and I was out weeding the garden and I found dahlias in the areas that I did not plant dahlias. So I let them grow, assuming they were tubers that I'd left in the garden a previous year, and they were different varieties of dahlias than what I had. So I thought, well, that's cool. These guys came from seed. I'm going to start growing dahlias from seed and see what happens. And Chris, yeah, so, oh, oops, sorry. Oh, that's okay. 
Um, yeah, so I started um, hybridizing, kind of getting into hybridizing when my son and I were growing giant pumpkins. So when he was little, like seven, eight, nine, ten, we used to grow giant pumpkins. I think the biggest we got was about 800 pounds. And those uh, giant pumpkin guys are all about hybridizing and collecting seed. And so we kind of, I kind of dipped my foot into that. And then when my son was in junior high, he's like, mom, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I decided to get into dahlias and um, it was really interesting because our society, we had some dahlia hybridizers there and, but there wasn't um, a whole lot of sharing going on as to how, you know, things were happening uh, with, with hybridizing, but I learned enough to kind of get going. And my goal, my original goal was just to do a fully double dahlia and um, I, couldn't do that. And so um, it took me about two years to figure out why that wasn't happening. Um, but um, I'm excited about learning, you know, from you guys and learning more about it too, from this panel. Great. So you kind of touched on this just a little bit right then, Christine. Um, but I'm kind of interested in, as you, all of you begin to hybridize dahlias, what type of goals did you set for yourself and how are you breeding towards those goals? So Rich, I'd like to start with you. Okay. So when I started, you know, like I was most taken by palms, by, by palm pondalias, you know, like being kind of like what I consider to be the perfect form of a dahlia. And I was just like, oh, that's really what I want to grow is pom-pom dahlias, you know, and really try to hybridize sun. Unfortunately, I live in a really hot part of the country and palms don't do really well here. But that's and that's where I started. And I think from there, really saying, hey, palms, miniature balls, balls, and then having flowers that I, I would say my number one goal has always been to please myself, you know, the dahlias that I like, you know. But then I think having nice colors and dahlias that other people want to grow, that's what my goals are. Okay, Wayne? Um, I think, so when I realized I can grow dahlias from seed, I started collecting seeds. And I, I we had a couple of collarettes in the garden. And I realized that those are, are, I mean, they're just seed makers compared to a fully doubled dahlia. So... The first year of actual trying, we wound up with a variegated orchid, and I was told that there's um, no dahlia in that classification. So that was kind of exciting. From there, I, I was looking at what was on the market as far as mignon singles went, and almost everything was a solid colored flower. And I think there's like four flowers, four colors out there. So I wanted to try to get colors into the mignon single realm. And it just takes forever, you know, a lot of trial and error, but I would say right now we're getting, you'll be seeing in the next couple of years, and this is over probably 15 years, you'll be seeing a lot of different colors from us. And we then, you know, along came orchids, and, and it was a brand new category. And I thought, well, oh, I wonder if I can make some of those. So we started working on those and um, then micros came along and we started working on micro collarettes. So those are the, the ones right now I really concentrate on. I do like fully doubled ones and I'm trying, but you know, it's easier to do the open center just because of seed count. So yeah. Uh, Christine. Yeah, so so early on, I think I just mentioned it earlier that my goal was just to get fully doubled because I spent the first year kind of opening my patch up to the bees and realizing if I had any singles or open center types in my garden. Um, the first year, all I got was open centers. I didn't get any fully doubled. I got some maybe bad, almost fully doubled, but not any good ones and 99% singles. So if you do have a, a single dahlia in your patch, even though my most of my dahlias were fully doubled, I would say only had maybe 5% open centers. Those those po That pollen dominates all your hybridizing. And, um, and so, it was really important for me to learn, but it took me a couple of years to learn that I needed to remove those singles, uh, cut out all my blooms and let them reboot if I just wanted the bees to do the open pollination. So it took me a couple of years. I, I really almost gave up because I was kind of frustrated, but um, 
I gave it one more year and did the culling and that made a huge difference. All of a sudden I was getting fully double and, and um, I did some hand pollination that year, even though not many people, I didn't, I don't think anybody was doing hand pollination, but with the giant pumpkins, it's all about um, hand pollination. So I thought I'd give it a try with, with dahlias. And um, the first year, I think I got three seed for all my work all summer. And, but I kind of looked out because one of them was Kay's Cloud, which is one that won an award for the American Dahlia Society. It was just beginner's luck is what I would say. But um, yeah, so that so that's um, that's how I set kind of my goals in, initially. And now I, now I have different goals each year or some of the same goals if I haven't met my goals. Great. And Leanne? The, um, I started from a different position. Uh, when I was evaluating a dahlia, I was looking for profitability for farmers. Um, so I took an, a, a survey of all the dahlias that I really liked that performed really well in my field. And I uh, made a list of all the traits that were important to me. Or sometimes it's easier to list the traits that um, you don't like first, and then you find the ones that you do. So in the end, I just sat out in the field and I came up with nine traits and they primarily focus on the plant first and foremost, because I needed these strong plants that had upright growth habits that would be um, easily branching and had long stems and that had great attachments to a desirable bloom. And so I just kind of chose the plants that fit those plant category categories. And at this time I was lucky because I did curate a collection of about 15 varieties that suited all of those traits. And I was able to collect a seed from them on a whim. I just decided at the end of the season, it was even after frost, I went through the patch and found a couple seed heads and that's what started it. And uh, I was really lucky. I ended up getting um, several good cut flower type plants from that even the first year and so 30 seedlings quickly went to like 300 and now that I'm up to like a thousand a year so uh the surprise the dynamic nature of the diversity of dahlias is really what hooked me and um again finding all of those plant traits uh to put them in a productive profitable operation is really what um encourages me Wayne, I'm going to ask you to answer this one first, but how do you select which seedlings you want to keep for the future? Okay, that's kind of a multi-tiered question. So the first thing I look for really is uh, form, and the second thing I look for is color. Um, if, for example, in a fully double dahlia, I have color that I really like, I'll keep it whether the form is good or not, if it has nice long stems. Um, we go beyond the form and the color in the third year, I start looking at tuber production. And if they're not a very good tuber producer, I will cull them regardless of how good of a flower they are. So if you were at the national show this year, you noticed some of our seeds did very well, but they're getting thrown out because they're not tuber makers. So. Okay. Christine. Well, um, what, what I like to do is um, to keep seedlings. Um, I, I like to keep the ones that are closer to my goals that I have for the year because I'm limited in space. I only have a quarter of an acre about that I grow on. I can't keep growing out lots and lots of, of my seed seedlings that are, you know might be good ones. Um, so I, I try to stay close to my goals. Um, and, and I'm also working towards certain colors. So if I'm hybridizing for the American Dahlia Society, I know I need to hybridize like really pure, clean colors, kind of bright, pure colors. But when I'm hybridizing for the cut flower community, they like um, uh, colors that are dusty, kind of antique -y, um, maybe unique. Um, you know, and muted colors and complex colors. And I, I really, um, like to hybridize for that. I used to be a painter. And so for me, it's kind of like I'm out in the garden and I'm painting and selecting uh, different colors to try to work those together and hoping that what I put together will make something pretty interesting. I'm also looking for 
how fl floriferous the plant is. So I like to have plants that produce a lot of blooms. And so that's important, um, strong stems, good tuber production, um, good storage life too is important for the tubers to store well. Um, if they don't store well, then it's, I think your variety kind of goes by the wayside pretty much if they, if they don't store well. Um, but I think when I'm out there, um, I also keep my keep open to the possibility of anything coming up that I might like. I mean, even if it's not centered around my goals, if I say, wow, this is a great one, I'm going to keep it. It's not even close to any of my goals this year. I just make sure that I that I do keep those those ones as well. Um, and then I think I think something to keep in mind, too, is is a lot of times with seedlings for me. Um, it's never one and done a lot of times. So sometimes what I'm doing, instead of um, hoping that this seed produces something great, I say this seed is 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 a way, is kind of like a little path towards something that I'm hoping to get. So I, I, I work on things for many, many years sometimes, like I'm trying for a brown. I haven't gotten my brown yet, so I'm still working on that. So things like that, um, I think it's good to keep that in mind. And I'm waiting for that brown too. Leanne. <laughs> um, remind me exactly what we're, the question is at this point. Sure. How do you select which seedlings you want to keep in the future? Uh, well, I take an inventory of the market. Um, there's a lot of great dahlias that are available. A lot of people show and you can see them online. Um, so I try to find gaps that I feel the cut flower farmers might need. Um, so I've been breeding for smaller blooms, tighter blooms with longer stems. Uh, a lot of florists are reaching out and trying to find those. And a lot of farmers are reaching out trying to find varieties that suit those needs. Um, so there's large categories I like to move forward in, and that's one of them. Uh, the other is, like others have said, try to still make it fun for you. Um, I do really enjoy the unusual. Um, like I said, as long as it's a, a desirable bloom and that desirability is really individualistic. Um, I have guests come to the fields a lot and they all have a different favorite. Um, so I do tend to use my gut as long as it meets all the other plant criteria I have, sometimes I'll keep a few wild cards, not many, and see how they go. Um, one this year is just different color pattern patternings, like yellow and pink. Um, I feel that that's beautiful and I don't see very many of them in the market. Great, thanks, and Rich. Yeah, no, I think very similar to the rest of the crew. I would say, number one, I, I want to breed for high petal count. You know, like I want a lot of petals, fully double dahlias. You know, I don't grow any open centers anymore, and I like them, but I just think it's too dangerous for my goals to have them. I don't grow water lilies, don't grow stellars, don't grow cactuses, you know, because all of those things will interfere with me having high petal count balls and decks, you know, so... High petal count, color for sure, you know, and that's kind of like what I'm most attracted to about dahlias between the high petal count, the color, the form, stem length, stem, stem strength, you know, I think as others have said, does it make a lot of flowers? Does it make tubers? You know, and then is it, you know, like Christine said this, you know, is it on a path somewhere? You know, because I think especially for color, you know, I think I've, I, you know, as you keep breeding your own seedlings, you know, you're able to get some better colors. And I, I would also say, you know, I don't grow yellow, you know, like yellow is so common, you know, like, and I'm, I'm starting to not grow some of the other really common colors like fuchsia and lavender, you know, I think just nature wants to produce, it seems like all yellow fuchsia and lavender flowers. And that's cool, but I want some other things. <laughs> Fair. Although I feel like there's not enough lavender in the world, guys. So <laughs> you'll have to start growing from seed. <laughs> I know. Leanne, I know you you love purple like I do. So <laughs> all right. So my next question was going to be kind of on the forms that you're hybridizing for, but you guys have already kind of touched on that. So I'm gonna skip um to the the next set of questions. And I want to talk more about some of the basics of hybridization. So can you talk us through how you pollinate your, your dahlias 
and how to achieve the goals you've set for yourself with the way that um, you kind of pollinate your field or your rose. So with that, Leanne, I'm going to have you go first on this one. Sure. Um, I am a mom to young kids. And when I first started, I was even still taking care of babies. So time is probably my most limiting resource. Uh, and I do what I call intentional plantings. Um, I plant all of my seed parents. It's what I call the dahlias I like to collect seed from together in a pattern that will encourage bees or other pollinators to continue to um, pollinate down a row. Um, orchards are planted in a similar fashion, just based on the habits of bee pollination. Uh, they like to be efficient and go down a row. And I've actually over time, I've seen that to be the case because I can see a seedling and see, oh, wow, you have traits of its neighbor. And so I feel like this has served me really well. Also, being in the Northeast, we do have a lot of cool, wet falls. And my seed production here is actually really low when considering the amount of dahlias that I grow. Uh, and I also only grow doubles in my cut flower seed parent bed. So I have a lot of petals. Um, that can rot. Botrytis is really big in this area if you're not on top of that. So um, again, it's time management. And also I plant in great numbers to hedge my ability to collect enough seed for what I'm going to use. Rich? Oh, Rich, you're muted. I was coughing, so I did go on mute for a second. Uh, open pollination, you know, like I, 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 I try a little bit of hand pollination, but I, I work long hours and I'm not here. The COVID year, I did a lot of hand pollination, but generally I'm not, when I retire, I'll do more. But I would also say separation and exclusion. So like I only grow certain forms and I only grow certain forms together. You know, I agree with Leanne about the row concept. I do grow in long rows, you know, one row of balls, one row of miniature balls, one row of palms, one row of formal decoratives. And then on the side of the house, all informal decoratives, you know, and then in the front of the house, I have a a low growing patch where I'm trying to focus on short dahlias, you know, so I would say uh, separation, exclusion of lots of forms that are not like, and then I, I use some help with ripening pollen and putting it near. So like, like the dahlias that I have behind me and a lot of other dahlias that are in my house right now, they'll be going outside in the next couple of days and I will put them in vases and I will tie the vases with zip ties to stakes right next to the places I want the bees to go to and from, you know, where I'm looking for, like, if I can get uh, certain varieties to have pollen ripen in the house and then put them right for a receiving seed parent, I think it helps. It's not perfect. It's not the same as hand pollination, but I think I am giving a big aid there. And then again, I exclude yellows. Yeah. <laughs> Christine? Um, well, I do I do kind of a little bit of, of everything. I do a fair amount of hand pollinating, like can spend three or four hours a day hand pollinating. Because um, I feel like with hand pollination, I can get closer to my goals that way um, and faster. Um, but I do a fair amount of open um, at, after I'm done doing all my hand pollinating. I do open pollination because um, I think it's pretty interesting. A lot of times when you do do open pollination, you get com combinations that you wouldn't have seen before. So um, like I had my water lilies and my um, my palms in the same row last year. And I got off of Pam Howden, I got um, four water lilies from Pam Howden. It's like. I would never have like hand pollinated those two together thinking I would get palms from that. And so I think it's really good to do open pollination as well as hand pollination. Um, you know, with hand pollination, uh, you know, you would be covering um, up the pollen parent and the seed parent with organza bags. They're those little clear kind of gauzy party bags. Um, I probably have 500 up covering blooms right now. Um, and so you do that, and then when the pollen's ready, I either take the pollen um, and, 
and scrape it off and put it into a little envelope and carry it back and forth to the different ones um, that I'm pollinating with. And I have lots of uh, paintbrushes. Those are not spreading the pollen I don't want. Those go in one pocket and uh, the clean ones in another. Um, so, you know, hand pollinating is, uh, is good that way in that you can start it as soon as the season starts. Um, as soon as you get blooms, you can do the hand pollinating. You don't have to eliminate colors or forms necessarily when you're hand pollinating because you're making the decision on what pollen is going where. And so um, I like that in some ways, but um, when I plant, I do plant like all my palms together in a row. I will put all my giants down a row. So I do do a little bit of that, but maybe not as much as like Leanne and Rich and, and maybe Wayne too, but um, I do do a little bit of that because I do like the open pollination at the very end of the season. And we can have a long season here because we really don't get rain um, until it could be end of October, could be no rain in November, we could get our first rain in December. So we can really um, have those seeds because once you pollinate the seed, they need to, the seed head needs to be on the plant um, a good like four weeks for the smaller varieties and I would say six weeks for the giants. And um, the giants are tricky too because we do get a lot of fog here in Santa Cruz and you get a lot of botrytis um, getting into the seed. And so I think that's something I'm gonna try to work on next year, try to find out how I can not have that happen because I do lose so many, especially the giants because they have so big heads, lots of petals. And Wayne, did I skip over you? I think I did that time. Yeah. All right. Well, before I um, okay, so we take into excuse me take into consideration how bees work. So we plant our forms in rows, like sounds like everybody else does, and then I take the wind in consideration. So you know you have a prevailing wind in the summers that comes from one direction, unless there's an ugly storm, but then the pollen falls down to the ground mostly in a storm. So yeah, the wind and the bees is what we use. And um, I have most, I have two different gardens. Most of my open centered dahlias are in one garden and then the fully doubles are all in the other garden with the exception of some seedlings that I'm growing. But I'll put those in the area where the wind's not gonna blow the pollen towards the fully doubled dahlias. So that's how we do ours. And Christine, this question might um, be specific to you, but can you share how you collect and store pollen for hand pollinating? Um, right. throughout the season? Okay, there, there's a couple of ways that I do it. I mean, one, if you get a lot of pollen, you can, um, you know, bring the blooms in like Rich has behind him there and collect pollen off of blooms that are in your house. So you can do that and then you can freeze it with a little um, in your freezer with a little desiccant inside with it. So I've done that and had successful plant uh, hand pollinating from frozen pollen. So that is something um, with hand pollination, you know, you are, um, you know, hoping to cross maybe two things and you, your pollen might not be ready when your um, seed parent is open and available. So frozen pollen is, is one of the things um, that you can do. Um, you can bring the bloom itself. So if, if, so like if I have a palm that has a lot of pollen on it, I'm not really interested in going from this palm to this palm with pollen and then back to the original one with the other pollen. I will just cut the bloom off, strip the leaves and kind of use the, use the bloom itself as a paintbrush and paint it onto the stigmas. So the pollen onto the stigmas that way. And then I'll just throw out the one that um, I just used or, if it looks like it can can have another day of pollen on it, I might bring that inside and wait for more pollen to bloom because what typically happens is the pollen starts on the outside and works its way towards the middle. And that can take anywhere from like four to seven days, depending on the on the variety. So you can the the bloom actually makes more pollen all the time um, up to a certain point until it kind of runs out of it. So um so I do that, I use the bloom itself, I freeze it, um, I can bring the bloom inside, um, I take the pollen 
Um, like I said, from inside, I can put it into an envelope and then take it right outside. And you do want to protect, when you're hand pollinating, you have to protect the pollen and the seed parent with those organza bags, or you have to bring the, the bloom inside for that. Um, the other thing you can do with hand pollination is you can self a plant. So um, I, I have done that with dahlias before and it's not super successful because you get a lot of inbreeding depression with that, but you do sometimes get an unusual bloom like um, Kay's Rosy Joe was self and it's a good variety. It doesn't have a lot of inbreeding depression. It grows well, it, the leaves are nice. The, the tubers are good. So every once in a while, and you can get kind of unusual colors from doing that, I think, and kind of unusual forms sometimes that come through with that. But um, you have to expect to have a lot of problems with inbreeding depression too with, with those. But um, I think the thing that I do most is when I'm out in the garden, I have an envelope and I collect the pollen from one and then go and collect the pollen from another and then then spread the pollen from the one to the to the other. And that's probably how I spend like 80% of my time doing it that way um, and trying to go for my goals while I'm doing that. Awesome, thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. So we're about to hit the season where all of us newbies are gonna run out to the garden and try to try our hand at hybridizing and saving seeds. And I'm curious to know, do you guys have a way that you organize how you're collecting your seeds and, and what you do with them? Are you labeling uh, who the parents are or is it a free for all? Um, so Rich, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Yeah, so definitely I do label them. So like I'll collect seed pods. I, I store them in paper bags and on the paper bag, I'll write the name of the seed parent if it is hand pollinated, the, the name of, you know, the pollen parent, the date that I took it, you know, uh, and then it goes in a dark room in the basement until, you know, Super Bowl time or whenever I start separating seed. But so every day, a new bag, you know, like, and I've, you know, I've got hundreds and hundreds of bags that I've used over and over and over and over again. And it, it it's also kind of interesting to see that, you know, like, a seed, a seed from the same parent collected weeks out will give radically different seed links, you know, especially with open pollination. Awesome. Wayne? Um, so I, I don't do a lot. I, I keep the same types together. So if I collect mignon, I keep mignon seeds together. You know, if I keep um, colorets, they stay together. If I keep fully doubled, I just mix all my fully doubled together. But interestingly enough, I'm working on a lot of dark reds right now in the fully doubleds. So I would say if somebody out there is wanting to collect seeds, it seems like Holly Hill, which is the popular one? Holly Hill, Black Widow? Black Beauty. Beauty. Black Beauty is a very good seed producer, and I'm getting quite a few decent flowers off of it. Yeah. Great. Christine? So, so when I'm out in the garden and doing the hand crossing, I have with me what are little jewelry tags, like one by two inch jewelry tags. And right away, when I do that hand cross, I write the pollen parent and the seed parent. So the seed parent goes on the top and the pollen parent on the bottom. And then I'll write the date that I did the pollination so that I don't, I tend to be I would say impatient to see my seeds and some so the date helps me because I know I need to leave them on there for at least at least four and better six weeks on to get really full mature seeds so that that helps me and then they also have the organza bag over them so that um, worms and other insects that like to eat the seeds don't get into the seeds and then when I collect the seed um, I bring them inside right away and I and I harvest my seeds immediately. So there's there's six weeks, they're fully mature. I get them out of the um, out of the seed head because um, a lot of times the seed head holds a fair amount of moisture. And I noticed in the past, and I think it's partially because we have a kind of a moist environment, we're like 60% humidity here, that it's best to get them out because I would get a lot of mold in there and I would lose a lot of seeds. And when you're hand pollinating and putting that kind of time in, I really don't want to lose seeds. So, um, 
So that works well for me. And then I just put them into these little coin envelopes like this. I'll write the number of seed I get from that cross. I write the cross here. So that's the seed parent and the pollen parent there. And then um, this one was a sib cross. So these two are siblings. So I'm crossing two siblings together. So I know that. And then down here, I'll have um, when I when I took out my seed um, and when when I pollinated. So I know that I that I, how many weeks. So if I'm getting seed at five weeks that don't seem to germinate well, then I know I really need to be um, shooting for that six weeks on them. It's just sort of something for me to help me be a little more patient. Yeah, that makes sense. Leanne? So I'm constantly fighting rot in the weather. Um, I will routinely go out and flag seed pods I'm watching. So I have a unique seed or a unique color of flagging tape. Uh, so usually it's bright pink. And if there's a, a pod that I know that has seed in just from palpating it, um, I will write the seed parent name on it and tag it. And that way, when I'm going out in my field, because I have thousands of plants that I'm looking at, I'm drawn to the ones that have tags to continually check them and see when they might be ready. As soon as they are ready and I harvest them, I just um, break them off or cut them off and I bring them directly inside. If it's a a seed that I'm particularly interested in, I'll do exactly what Christine does. I will shuck them fresh. And what I do is I will um, pull them out and I actually let mine um, dry out in open air paper Dixie cups because I can label the Dixie cup with the variety name and just kind of let them air out again because of molds and different types of rots that could happen. Additionally, I always have to fight armyworms. Um, they will get down in the seed head and just eat everything. So if I don't immediately open them up, um, there's a chance I could lose everything where they, I might have a few good seeds if they happen to be in there because you, you can't really see them uh, from the outside most of the time. If they are seed pods that I have a lot of and I just need to dry them out, I will bunch them together. Let's say I have 30 of the same variety. Then I'll just do a big batch and um, open up all the seed heads, like crack them up either in half or quarter them and then put them in a large tray and let them air out quickly in my garage, similar to how you would dry flowers. Like you just want air circulation, you want hotter air because we are also dealing with wetter, more humid falls and that'll help the drying process. And then again, if there's army worms or there's any chance of molds, I'm stopping that from destroying my seed crop. And then once they're dry, I typically, the bulk stuff just kind of hangs out until I'm at a place where I can sit down at my kitchen table and take care of it, which is usually December. Um, but the really special stuff I'll immediately take out of the Dixie cups and put into labeled coin envelopes, very similar to Christine, with all the information I need to know when it was collected, who the seed parent was, um, if there was anything special about it, like it was particularly planted next to things that I really wanted to trial, uh, I'll make note of that too, because I keep that information moving forward. It helps me make better decisions in the future. That makes sense. All right. So I'm going to combine a couple questions here because you guys have, have kind of started to talk about this a little bit. But when we talk about breeding for specific traits, whether that's form, color, or height, do you have a specific approach towards that? Um, and with that, uh, Wayne, do you want to go first on this one? Sure. Um, usually what I'm looking for is color because the forms are already there. Um, so I put together colors that I want to cross with a white. So if I'm looking for something variegated or red, I'll put those together with a white dahlia of the same form and then hopefully from the white dahlias, I'll get the colors that I'm looking for. But um, it's, it's you know, it's just such a crapshoot. <laughs> I don't know. We, we're looking for shorter stuff when we're looking for mignons. So, yeah, you put everything together size-wise with those. Um, and, of course, if, if I'm doing fully doubled stuff, I'm putting together my mini balls side by side. And I'm looking at what colors do I want to cross? Like I, I'm a, a real fan of orange, and I know that 
pink comes, uh, you know, pink and orange are very close on the color spectrum. So I'll plant those together to see if I can get something orange out of that. And yeah, it's just, I still think it's all luck though, regardless of what I tried doing. You know, I've been shooting for a, a nice yellow mignon for years and I've, I'm starting to get yellow mignons, but now I've got to put those together next to a good white form and see what we can get out of that. But it takes a long time. We got to be patient. Christine? Um, when I'm breeding for specific traits, um, like for color, I just really think like kind of intuitively, like what, what, what do I think, you know, these two would, would make? And it, then dollies are octoploids. So it's, it's a crapshoot really too. Um, but I do try to do that. And sometimes I really, I do luck out one year I bred for, um, apricots and I got a ton of apricots. I'm like, wow, that was successful. But then, you know, the next year I breed for brown and I get no brown. So, you know, you don't, you don't really know um, with that, but I do um, tend to uh, breed like types together. So like if I was going for water lily, I would go water lily to water lily, but like in that other example, uh, you know, I did water lolly to got a palm on it and I got palms. So it's like, um, you know, it's a it's pretty iffy what you're going to get. Um, but when I do giants, I, I tend to hand pollinate giants to giants because that seems to work really well or a variety that's large for to large. Ian. I agree with, um, every, what everyone said, I'm just going to add a different perspective. I think when you have done it for many years, the historical data is so important, especially if you know the parentage. And this is where I feel like if I was able to hand pollinate, I would have like so much more information. But if I know three, four, even five generations back, the type of traits that come out of those siblings and those seed parents, um, I'm able to then take my seedlings as seed parents and be more intentional, uh, specifically if um, I'm really looking for darker leaves or darker stems, like really branch off, or maybe I'm looking for lace leaves instead of the big broad leaves. And I'm able to keep the traits that are core to my business, but add in those extra variations um, just by being able to know historically what I've been able to get from the genetics. Thanks, Leanne. So this is kind of, I'm hoping you guys are, are willing to share, but sometimes in hybridizing, you know, there's trade secrets that you guys have, but I'm curious to share if, are curious to know if you'd share, are there proven seed parents that uh, you might recommend uh, for people just starting out that you're kind of willing to share. So with that, um, let's see, Christine, do you want to go? Yeah, um, I did, I did um, the Holly Hill one too that, that Wayne did, and that produces a lot of seed. Holly Hill, um, I'm, now I'm spacing on the name. Black Beauty. Black Beauty, that is a really good one to start out with, I would say. I've always had good success with with that one. Um, but I think I think what makes like a good seed parent would be um, kind of really depends on what you have in your own garden. I mean, I could tell you what I have in my garden. Um, when I hybridize, I'm hybridizing a lot of seedlings together. So that would be something that would be hard for someone to get. But once you get to know, like Leanne was saying, like once you get to know your 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 plants and and what they can do for you, that's that's a really um, important part. And so you once you, I, I think even if you were beginning um, hybridizing, you might want to just do open pollination and see which parents will actually give you seed because some some varieties are sterile. They won't produce seed. Um, some of them are, it's the end of the line. They're not, they don't ever produce any um, pollen or stigma or anything in the middle. So that, that nothing, you can't do anything with those. And so I think it's important when you um, are working and other parts of the world, they don't have the same varieties as we do. So it's important to learn your varieties and learn what they can give you. And I think a good way to start out as a, maybe a beginner would be to call up, if you want fully doubled, call out, call out your um, 
singles and just just let the bees do it. And then you'll know like Holly Hill Black Beauty, Make Seed, that would be a good one if you were going to do hand pollination. That would be a good one to start with because you know it may, it can make seed. And even though we're not as efficient as, as the bees, we we can still um, get seed from Holly Hill Black Beauty if we do hand pollinate. So I think I think that's um, important to do. Um, and um, you know I am always working towards my goals. So it depends on what your goals are for your hybridizing program too. So I could tell you like Holly Hill Black Beauty is a great um, seed parent, but if your goals are, um, you know, a giant fully doubled one, then that wouldn't help you out at all. So you're just going to have to work. And also with your climate, like, can you do giants? Because they take a long time to grow. The, the seed takes six weeks at least to get fully mature. You know, are you going to get rain in the meantime and the seeds are going to rot? So you just have to really learn about your, um, your varieties and, um, so I think I think that's the most those are the most important things. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share a little bit. I'm going to plug a ADS publication because when I first started, I was hungry for this information, too. And I found some gems in um, Dahlia's of today. Like this is an older publication. Uh, you want to talk about um, hybridizers spilling the tea, they throw valuable gems of information throughout this publication and other Dahlia publications. And I think you can still buy back issues because that's what I did. Um, total geeking out here. And I, I mean, that's how I would discover lineages on the, the varieties I really liked because you're sometimes you're never going to know but randomly you come across, oh, well, they just published it because the hybridizer shared that bit of information. So I have a document that I continually build when I find out this stuff. Um, and so I would just say be discoverers, be treasure seekers, and go through the publications that are already out there. You'll find some great information. And then start with what you like. Um, like Christine mentioned, uh, you know, there's something about dahlias that brought you to them and just start there. And there's nothing better than your own experience. So don't be afraid to touch your dahlias. Don't be afraid to tear a couple seed pods apart to learn what is a mature seed. Is it making seed? And I can tell from experience that I might have a row of a hundred of the same variety, but only find five seed pods that have seeds in that variety. So you do have to be intentional at times to find what you're looking for. Um, and I'm constantly in there touching every single seed pod. Timing is really important. Some years I get lots of seeds out of certain varieties. Other years I don't get any. Uh, for example, I don't think I've ever gotten seed from Sugartown Sunrise, Rock Run Ashley, Blizzard in my fields, but other areas do. Um, so I feel like some varieties just take much longer to mature seed than others. Some varieties that you can quickly get a hold of that make a lot of seed are the Cornell series. They make a lot of seed and they have great tubers and they have a great plant habit. Uh, Peaches and Cream makes a lot of seed, as does Coralie. There's some um, really standards that constantly do make seed, and that's just where you start from because maybe the pollen of another is viable and you'll never get seed from it. Um, so you need a good seed producing parent at first to get started. Great. And Leanne, what year was that today? Um, this one was from 2010. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I bought back a, a while because I'd like to do that. I believe they do it every five years because I have, I have the last like 20 or so years worth. And I think it's every five years. Oh, that's a lot, Rich. That's okay. What Leanne said this, that's really good information. So. Yep. All right. Rich, what about you? Yeah. I think there's endless good seed parents. You know, like, I think you just got to go and try. I think one thing that I heard, you know, I think everybody say is, you know, try it and then make good records, you know, like, and try 40 to 50 seeds from each parent. So you can have some real data, you know, and, and then you have to evaluate, you know, like I evaluate every seedling, you know, and, and, and 90, I don't know, 95 
or higher percent get thrown out the first year, but I still evaluate them, you know, but I, I think there's endless good seat parents. And I think, you know, like Christine said, you know, go with your goals, you know, if it's color, if it's lots of petals, if it's ball form, if it's open center, you know, like go with your goals. I think that should, that should be it there. Uh, a couple of favorites that I've had over the years, I think Brookside Snowball is a really good seed parent. It makes seed and like Wayne inferred earlier, there's something about white dahlias making seed that gives you endless colors. You know, like you're not going to get endless, you know, you're not going to get purple from yellow most of the time, you know, like, uh, but I think white could almost give you anything. Uh, I like Frank Holmes. I like Blight and Softer Gleam. You know, almost now, almost all of my seed comes from my own seeds, from my own seedlings, and mostly just numbered seedlings, not named seedlings. And I think, I think most long-term hybridizers, that's where they get their seed, you know, as they have certain seedlings that may not be ever good enough to introduce, but either make a lot of seed or make good seed seedlings. And I think it's just getting started and doing it, keep some records, you know, you have to grow enough, you know, like if you're going to grow 10 seedlings, you know, you might be disappointed, you know, like I think, I think a hundred is a good number to try and a hundred in a four foot by four foot patch is fine. You know, like seedlings don't have to be spread out like regular plants, but just get going and you'll find your seed parent. And Wayne. Okay, I will give you my seed parent first that I thought was the best one I've ever used, and that's Fancy Pants. It was an orchid, and uh, we used Fancy Pants uh, along with a bunch of the orchids that we had, and that's where we got all of our orchids from. And then I will touch on what Leanne said. Line breeding is amazing. So, I mean, I almost every plant in my garden is one of our introductions now. So we line breed like crazy and I think you know the more you start breeding your forms with each other the more you're going to get the forms you're looking for when you're line breeding so that's really where success comes from so it's uh, again that would mean that it's not going to be an overnight success thing that means you're going to put years into this and you know it was interesting when you introduce your first one um you're three to four years out five years out You've been hybridizing for five years, probably by the time people start recognizing that you've introduced something. So it's a it's a time game. Yeah, I will say I've gotten seeds from all four uh, of your introductions at, at some point. So my tip is you, I feel like you can't go wrong with any of the stuff that you guys are putting out. But all right, two more questions left. Um, we haven't touched on this too much yet, but the American Dahlia Society has a set of standards that dahlias are judged on. One of the things you could do as a hybridizer is submit your cultivar to a trial garden where it can be scored according to those standards. And I'm curious to know, do you guys submit your seedlings? Um, and if you do, what about that process appeals to you? And Leanne, I'm going to start with you on this one. <laughs> I'm the least expertise of the bunch here in terms of that, because I primarily market my dahlias for the commercial market. Um, the cut flower market, while there can be a lot in common with ADS, uh, form is a little more fluid and what florist or other farmers markets want. So I'm not constrained to that and I can be a little more creative and inventive and in putting things out in the market. However, I won't say I will never do it. I feel like there's a lot of great qualities and to have a process in place with standards is a very good thing. I've tried to replicate that in the cut flower um, traits that I put into a cozy town dahlia. Uh, so I enjoy going to shows and really talking with judges and the people here on this panel uh, to find out um, how the process has been helpful in moving them forward. So I will pass it on to someone else at this point. Sure. Rich. Yeah. So, yeah, I do. I do from time to time submit it to the trial gardens and I do 
seedling benches. I did that over the weekend and I've done it all show season. You know, I think part of it is just getting other people to independently judge what you have based on criteria. I think that's helpful. You know, I also do uh, participate in the trial garden in the DC area. So we have the Mid-Atlantic Trial Garden, which is, you know, 40 minutes from where I live. And it's a real pleasure to see what other people are growing, you know, on the West Coast and Canada and Midwest or whatever, and they send it there. And I think it gives me a better idea of like what people are looking for and, you know, and, and whatever. It's also a big social thing, which I think is helpful. But yeah, I think it's helpful. But I think there's other ways to get there. You know, I think having having people who have a experience with flowers, having them grow it or having them see your stuff too, I think is also really valuable. Great, Wayne. Um, so we do trial gardens occasionally, and I, the reason why I like trial gardens is because then we get feedback from how the plants are growing in other parts of the country. So that's really helpful for us. One of the things that one of the reasons I don't do them more frequently is because I'm not very organized, and by the time I start thinking I need to contact trial gardens, they're full. So. Um, maybe once I retire, I'll have more time to be organized, but we'll see. We do mainly ADS seedling bench because we have so many shows around us. That we have a lot of opportunities to get our, our seedlings on the bench. And there you're being judged too. I think in a trial garden, you get um, a more better overall judge um, of the plant. So, I mean, we're judging the whole plant in a trial garden. On the ADS bench, a lot of the judging is based on how good of an exhibitor the person is. So you probably get a, a truer uh, score of a dahlia in the trial garden than you would on an ADS bench, but both ways are good. And Christine. Yeah, um, I, I, I like to see how my varieties grow in other, other climates and other places. And I like the feedback that I get. So I do put some of my um, seedlings um, in the trial gardens and I have benched them and, and won awards with those. But um, I, I think it's, I think it's kind of just, it's fun to do. I mean, you have to be pretty um, thinking ahead when you're, when you're planting your garden the previous year, because you have to send about 25 tubers or cuttings to the trial gardens. And they are very specific about when they should arrive and, and all that, um, and it's it's a little bit of a crapshoot because like if Rich puts in one of his balls and I put in one of mine, and you know his is good and mine is good, you know then then it's a it's definitely a competition where if one of us had entered the previous year and there wasn't as much competition, then we would have won. So it's a little bit um, it, uh, there's a fair amount of luck in the in the trial garden too as to whether you're going to win a, an award and um but it does if it scores 85 or higher it gets into the american dahlia society classification book and it's nice if it gets an award um that award follows your um variety for the rest of the life that it's in that in that book so people could say oh that one a daryl hart award or that one the dudley so those sometimes people like to grow the varieties that are that have one at the trial gardens, but um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun, but it does take some extra work. Feels like there's an opportunity for you guys to kind of strategize here a little yeah. bit. So what yeah. are you going to do? Why are you putting one in this year? <laughs> Wayne, Wayne's kind of in his own. Well, you probably put doubles in too. Do you? Yeah. yeah. So we need to know what they're doing, but you don't really know until you put it in. So. So last question of the night, I know we're closing in on that hour mark, but I'm curious to know what you're introducing for 2024 and where people can buy your introductions. Um, so Rich, why don't you go ahead on this one? All right, I'm fully prepared for this. So they're behind me. Oh yeah. <laughs> so oh, look at that. Yeah, so I have three varieties that I'm introducing next year. So on this side here is 20th Ave Pink Cloud, which did get a score on, on, the, on the seedling bench. It's a BB, pinkish, orange, coral, peach, whatever color it might be. Uh, grows really nice, you know, good stems and really a good amount of petals. I like it a lot. Uh, I have the one in the middle is gonna be 20th Ave Delicada. It's a 
light pink, delicate, small miniature ball. And then the dark pink here is a nice dark pink ball, which has done really well at the shows. Uh, and it's called 20th Ave for Mom. And so those three will be available next year. And uh, my varieties are sold through Crazy for Dahlias, crazyfordahlias.com. Awesome. You can, me, you can see me on Instagram too. I think like most of the rest of us, I am on Instagram and I will be, I haven't posted as much this summer, but I will be posting more you know, over the next few weeks. Great. Thanks, Rich. And your Instagram handle is at 20th Ave Dahlias, right? Yeah. All right. Wayne, I know you're not on Instagram, but what about your introductions? Uh, I think we have low peach, which is a dark blend of um, kind of dark red and orange or yellow mignon single. And it was high scoring on the ADS seedling bench at the national show. We have low grape, which is a mignon single purple and low orange, which is a mignon single orange. I think those are the only ones we'll be introducing this year, but you know, to put a little plug in, we do introduce all the cause dahlias and all the um, uh, skipley dahlias now, and all the, boy, this is bad. I'm drawing a blank on this one, but. Uh, we have your daughter's dahlias too, right? Ray oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. She's yeah. not introducing <laughs> me this year, um, but um, Dick Parcells dahlias, Clearview. Oh, Clearview. Yeah. So. And don't you do Max too? Yeah, Max. Did I yeah. say? Oh, I said their last name and not their their yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. And, and so, where is that? They'll be on lobosdalias.com. There you go. Um, Christine. Yeah, so we kind of took a year off last year. So this year um we have 10 new varieties. So it's gonna be a big year for us. Um uh, so you can see those um, on our website, which is Santa Cruz Dahlias. Um, you can see them on my Instagram at, um, at Santa Cruz Dahlias. Um, so you can kind of see them. We just put up, uh, up all of them on Instagram just this last week. So you can look at them with the names and all that. And um, the new introductions, the, the 10 new ones this year will be um, sold through Stonehouse Dahlias and they do um, rooted cuttings. And um, so that's really exciting. Um, and they're all uh, virus free. We've, we've tested everything. And so um, it's, it's really good because they'll, they'll grow a lot better and they'll be happier that way. Uh, Micro Flower Farm is also introducing um, Kay's Coral C, which is a, um, like a BB sized informal decorative that's um, kind of a coral, a brownish coral color. So i um, excited about that. And then some of our older varieties, um, so well, Stonehouse carries those, uh, Micro Flower Farm has some of those, and then Triple Wren has a few of our old varieties. So that's where um, most everything is. Great, and Leanne. Oh, I haven't finalized the catalog yet because, you know, you can't sell until you know the tuber store. So um, there will be at least two that were on the agenda last year that I had to pull from the catalog just because, you know, tubers, things can happen, but they're back in the field. They are not lost. And uh, so there's be Bermuda Pink, which everyone is wanting to look at. Um, that is a four foot I'm going to classify it as a garden dahlia just because it, it is a super sturdy plant and you really have to manicure it into a cut flower. Um, so it does have thicker stems, but it does a beautiful blush pink and then will sport bronze. And I haven't been able to capture that sport and have it be stable. So you get the best of both worlds in the cut flowers because everyone wants a bronze and everyone wants a blush peak and pink. And so you'll have that. There will be a, um, a, blush, well, a hazy purple that has a white reverse. I call it sugarberry. Uh, that will be available. And everyone that sees it in person loves it. It's one of those colors that's hard to photograph. I've done my best, but I'm looking forward to releasing that one. And then four brand new ones, all great cut flowers with exceptional stems. I have a white that routinely 
each offshoot gives me 24 inch strong stems. I'm really excited to get that out in the world. And then uh, another one is purple and orange, very similar to like a Jowie Winnie color, um, but larger and a very firm petal. Like when you're thinking about handling flowers or even possibly shipping dahlias, like this is like holding a baseball. And I think that's one of its um, superpowers, you know, at this time. So, and I haven't named them because I am getting superstitious. It seems like every time I try to name something, something happens. So I'm going to hold off on that, but you can find out more on my Instagram at Cozy Town Flowers. And then uh, definitely on my website, the sale is usually in February and uh, yeah. So stay in touch. Great. Well, I think that is it for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I want to thank everybody on the panel for coming and sharing your knowledge with us and kind of talking us through how to hybridize. And I want to thank everybody who hopped on the live stream. I know we're over 100 at the moment. So we really appreciate everybody who took time out of their night to come and participate. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream. So 